how I let money define me. I remember the first year it came. My mom and I stood there in silence staring at it. A white envelope slipped under our door. No name, no address, no markings at all. Just an envelope of money. I watched my mom's hands shake as she picked it up and I noticed some tears rolling down her cheeks. And even as an eight-year-old girl, I knew that this was a significant and meaningful moment. I guess I just didn't realize how significant it would be and how exactly that moment would change my life. <clears throat> Every year the money would come, grade three, grade four, grade five, all the way to grade 12, the plain white envelope of money. As certain as December would come, so would the envelope. During my younger years, I was confused as to what it all meant. I guess I had no idea how much trouble we were in. I thought it was normal to have empty cupboards and to eat rice four times a week, to grow up with no running water, just an outhouse and a bath once a week and a bucket in my kitchen after my grandpa bathed in it. <laughs> Ew. To grow up that way was normal to me. The food baskets that people kept bringing, I thought, was my mom's bingo prize from Saturday night at the Legion. She was really good at bingo. And when I heard her crying at night, I guess I thought it was just years of past hard life, not necessarily her struggles this year. As I grew up and turned into the stubborn and determined woman everyone knows me to be today, I wasn't going to sit back with quiet acceptance. I was determined to find out who was behind this, these envelopes of money. I mean, really, how could somebody drop off a gift as significant as this? without ever needing anything back in return. I went as far as setting up my own detective agency in uh, the hall closet of my house, complete with after school hours, a Christmas stamp, and an old phone plugged into my boot. I had three years of envelopes to analyze. There must be some evidence here. I interviewed our neighbors. I dusted for fingerprints with flour. I took the envelopes to the post office to be analyzed by Mrs. Lallier. One December, I actually sat in the hallway near our door after school doing my homework, determined to catch the good guy red-handed. Well, years went by, and I never found out who, and I never found out why. I was forced to accept it. But I did spend my entire life thinking about that someone who gave this gift year after year after year without ever receiving anything in return. I spent the next 15 years of my life traveling the world doing development work, working multiple side jobs and dedicating all of my time, money and resources to people in need. No matter where I went or what program I set up, I always returned with more than I went with. However, despite all of the extremely satisfying experiences abroad, at a certain point I began to reach a wall in my development work. In a heavily saturated market with a million great causes, how do you get your own story heard? I saw people burnt out by the same old images, the same old stories, the same old problems of Africa. <clears throat> I even started to notice people that I knew leave the room or start side conversations as I told them about the adventures of my trip. Quite often I'd come home carrying burdens of things I had seen, traveling multiple times a year to extreme poverty areas and conflict zones, and aside from a crazy supportive husband, I was left by the rest of my world to quietly internalize my findings. People had heard this story before and had simply stopped listening. <clears throat> so I stopped talking, and in a way, I guess I fell out of love with the idea that people cared. Now looking back, that wasn't an accurate assessment. It wasn't that people didn't care. 
It was just that they needed to see this story from a different perspective. I began my fashion career <clears throat> maybe as a distraction, maybe as a platform for my creativity to land. We were launching collections around the world, manufacturing lots of product, attending fashion weeks and fashion parties, truly living the creative dream. However, as my brand grew, my fashion label name grew, my interest in it honestly began to fade. I struggled with the contrast of my worlds, often traveling from Africa right into New York City. And as thoughts of people struggling to find food swirled around my head, I was surrounded by people talking about their shoes. You'd be surprised of how many people talk about their shoes. While I loved the creative exploration of fashion, and it was a part of me, I'm a very creative person, it began to create a huge void in me, and the superficiality of it all began to overwhelm me. People loved what I was doing in fashion. They liked the brand and the clothes, and that actually started to surprisingly bother me. Why did people care so much about the clothing I was making? I noticed people cared about the lifestyle of fashion and clothing. Why does fashion have a larger reach or a larger voice than philanthropy? It was on a plane ride back from Premier Vision, the Paris fabric show, that I pieced it all together. It was getting harder and harder for me to fundraise, and it was also at the same time getting harder and harder for me to find real inspiration to design the next collection. It was in that pivotal moment that I realized I needed to give meaning to my craft, and I needed to apply creativity to my development work. When I started to think about that and what a collection with meaning could look like, it all began to come together. The idea that I could combine my talents with my passion to create change truly excited me. So I started to think about <clears throat> the things I saw on my trips, and aside from being inspired by the moments and the results and the people I was meeting, I was also heavily inspired by the images and photos of other things, things like landscapes, silhouettes, patterns and symmetry, <clears throat> curves and contours, traditions, the beautiful traditions, mystery, color, culture, the playfulness, shapes, tribal rituals, the determination of the people, the strength I saw in so many people's eyes, the hope, and the future optimism. I was filled up with the exciting thought that creativity could create change in our world. Now instead of searching for and sometimes having to invent or manufacture inspiration to get through the next season, I was finding it around every corner. <clears throat> and it was real life inspiration with real life people as the recipients. Fashion now had a purpose and the proceeds would be used to create change. Let me quickly show you what that creative process looks like for me now. <clears throat> The inspiration from Spring 13 <clears throat> came from a real need. Now, I need to give you a little background information for this to make sense. South Sudan holds some of the world's last pastoralist animist societies in the world, a beautiful, rare culture preserved by 40 years of civil war. So, still, today, 80% of the conflict remaining in South Sudan emanates from these cattle camps. Nomadic in nature, these communities containing 10,000 livestock and 5,000 people repeatedly come together in violent territorial clashes, ending in widespread casualties. Forced to provide for and protect their cattle and their people, they must fight for their basic need, water, food, and land. Due to the continual outbreaks, there's immense political pressure to come up with a solution. Believing the only way to cease conflict is to dissolve this culture completely, disbandment plans have become a regular government discussion. <clears throat> Believing that water has the ability to reduce conflict and stabilize regions, we developed a plan with the support of the UN, 
where we're drilling livestock watering stations and water, and water for people in these identified conflict zones in order to show that there can be a peaceful and potentially preservative solution. So how do we take that and put it into a fashion collection? Well, it starts with a series of mood boards like I just showed you here. And then we take it and we put it into color palettes are designed. We do our own graphic prints. Um, we look at silhouettes, textures, shapes, everything um, is set. These are two seasons together. Top is spring, bottom is fall. It just gives you an idea. But what we're <clears throat> meant to do with our collections or what I'm supposed to do is be able to translate these themes into clothing. The spring collection is meant to tell the story of an ancient pastoralist society threatened by the modern world. Modern fabrics and silhouettes were layered over tribal traditional prints to show an unsettling contrast between two realities. Custom design prints represent the impending destruction of beauty and its consequential loss. Strong collars and detailing pay homage to the strength of South Sudanese tradition while sheer paneling reflects the dissolving of such by modern time. Within a foundational palette of black and white, the blue symbolizes water and is a hopeful reminder of a peaceful solution to be generated from the sale of this collection. So we translate it into garments, we do our photo shoots, our catalog, our editorial, and then we do uh, usually a film. So this film sort of summarizes what I just talked about here. Pick apart the pieces of your heart. Let me peer inside. Let me in where only your thoughts have been. Let me occupy your mind as you do travel the world, I look first for the need. And then I look for the way that I'm going to creatively present it to you. Once a collection is sold or a campaign is executed, I take it back to the field and we carry out the projects. Real results are obtained and we are all a part of creating that change. I have one more video I'd like to show you. The story begins in a time of unrest, tension, turmoil, and division with attacks by force and fire. Abstraction and fragmentation as viewed from above. Textures crash and overlap in tensions of black and white. Patterns weave wildly, sometimes violently. Colors like a thousand voices scream in crimson while shadows hide in the dark hues of night. After four decades of storm, we stop in silence. The land is drained, its cracked surface lies bare and burnt. The future hangs uncertain as dust settles. The possibility of renewal is overwhelming. Smoke begins to thin and familiar designs shift, change shape, reform. Voices soften. Silhouettes appear, hauntingly serene, their patterns move closer. Ceremonial scars of tribes are revealed. 
a holy return from a spiritless battle. This collection was a great opportunity for me to merge fashion and philanthropy. So the inspiration this season is the story of South Sudan and how the story unfolds chronologically through the country's dramatic timeline in three stages. The first delivery is about the opposition of the North and South, the dramatic conception of war. Themes are shown through smoke and the contrast of black and white, all scattered over this rich palette of copper and crimson, all telling the story of an ignited chaos over oil. Second delivery is Sudan now. The land is barren and cracked, and its people scattered and displaced. We use this calming palette of wheat and soil, including coarse lines and vectors representing that tribal scarring of the many tribes around the land as these villages come together to rebuild. The last delivery is about a future optimism. It's a time for rebuilding and celebration, all told through a hopeful palette of water. In our current drilling efforts, we lay the cement, we bring water to the surface, and the village comes to life. The more people that hear this story, the more water wells we'll be able to drill, and that's really what this whole thing is about. South Sudan in particular is a part of the world that has been forgotten. Many people don't even know where South Sudan is or what has happened to them for the last 40 years. For me, with this Fall 12 collection, I'm able to tell the story of South Sudan through a chronological timeline on a canvas I know best. Through fashion, I'm able to tell that story and in turn able to make a difference. So I hope that gives you an idea of how you can merge two things together like this. Um, I just want to close by sharing one final story. Um, last dry season, uh, Obak Foundation drilled 300 water wells. And while I'm very proud of that, that isn't what moves me or inspires me or fills me up. These are just numbers, they're not moments. I live for meaningful moments. Those moments that connect you to people. Last week, a 13-year-old girl ran after me in the hall of her school after I did a class presentation to, the, to their school. She had tears in her eyes, and she told me that I inspired her to create change in her world. That is a moment. Sitting under a 
tree with an elder in Africa holding the chicken they gave me that was the only chicken that they ever had in that village. That's a moment. It's not the big things in life, it's the meaningful moments that we create through our actions. And it's our place in the world and how it impacts others. You've seen this dress in the video. Well, <clears throat> when I designed it, I thought about the color, the red that represents the history and the bloodshed of war. The shine represents the future optimism and the twist represents the traditional way of wearing garments in South Sudan. It was one of our best-selling dresses that season and I thought I had thought of everything when I designed it. However, what I didn't think about is what the dress actually meant and what it could mean to somebody. Last time I was in New York City, I was doing a live interview <clears throat> and a photo shoot for Elle magazine and we used these South Sudanese models to come and help me tell the story. Well, these are girls that <clears throat> I've been in touch with that I'm established friendship relationships with. And the girl behind me, her name is Ajang. <clears throat> Excuse me, she's wearing the dress that I'm speaking of. She followed me around quietly and always had. And it wasn't until I sat down to interview her that I found out the impact that this dress had on her life. Ajang has a super sad story. As a young child, she was caught in war and she has seen many things. As a child, she would hide under beds as bullets flew through the air. She watched her dad killed in front of her, and both her, her and her mother have post-traumatic stress disorder as a result of the things she's seen. As I sat talking with her, she told me that everything changed when she put on this dress. It was, a, it was as if this dress was telling the story of her life and was speaking to her. She told me that the tie around the waist <clears throat> is what Sudanese women or men do. They tie a cloth around their stomachs and pull it tight to ease their pain. Somehow, this dress told the story of her life and somehow gave her the courage to stand up and face her past. It was just a dress, one of 120 in that collection. I had no idea the impact that this dress would have and the meaning that it would have on somebody's life. I don't think we ever really know how much reach we have when we give, when you truly put yourself out there to give back. You don't have to give large, you don't have to have a company or even leave your own country to do it. You just give. Give yourself. Give money. Give your time, your music, your mind, your craft. By giving, you won't only fill yourself up with meaningful moments, but you could potentially influence or affect someone else's life really beyond your wildest imagination. Who would have known that their gift, one that they truly gave without expecting anything in return, would have helped set the course of my life? That gift taught me to help when I can help, to act without expectation, and to do it now because somewhere someone is sitting in need. If the person who gave that gift knew the ripple effect of their gift, I bet they would think that their money was well spent. Thank you. So I'm going to start with the first question. The first question is you spoke of these memorable moments that you encounter when uh, you're speaking with people, you're working with people, you're traveling, you're, you're seeking creativity, and then suddenly there's that little memorable moment. How do you know you're in it? What's that little spark that suddenly presents itself? Well, it's really just a visceral reaction to what's going on. You feel... It's that overwhelming sense of emotion. So when I'm referring to meaningful moments, I think any meaningful moment to me is a moment that moves me, that makes me feel something sad, proud, happy. So any emotion. Yeah, the, it's an emotional thing. The yeah. fiercer level of emotion. Mm -hmm. awesome. Anybody relate to that? No. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. So who, who's got a question? I'm going to take the path of least resistance here. So just introduce yourself and then ask your question. <laughs> Um, I'm Nisa, and um, we were discussing your ability to pull tangible elements um, from your surroundings, and you clearly have a connection to Africa. Um, and we were wondering if you've ever considered um, pulling inspiration from perhaps a different area, maybe downtown east side, something mm -hmm. else in your environment or something in your Absolutely, absolutely. I think um, I sh only showed you Africa, however, 
I spent many years of my life traveling to Romania and other parts of the world. And even when I'm in my travels that aren't development work, I'm looking around me and I'm inspired by the things that I see. We were just in orphanages in Vietnam when we were there. And um, I'm definitely inspired by moments outside of Africa and by uh, my inspiration comes from many different places. I just happened to start in Africa and you have to start somewhere. So yeah, my plans are to move into other places and um, my inspiration isn't just limited to Africa for sure. Any hints? No. <laughs> I love insider secrets. One, one question over here. Hi, my name is Jared. Uh, I'm a design student at Emily Carr. And um, just had a quick question. I um, really appreciated your uh, simplistic, very um, clean uh, imagery. Um, and my question is, as you find inspiration in this, in this wild setting, of Africa, mm -hmm. or perhaps in other wild areas. Um, how do you balance telling that authentic narrative with, I mean, seeing as this is money month, <laughs> with perhaps more business agenda oriented things? Like, like how do you avoid the exploitation of mm -hmm. indigenous people groups? <clears throat> and I don't mean indigenous for Africa, but just anything that's wild. Like, yeah. how do you tell that story in an authentic way, but it's still time, like, balance it with these business Right, yeah, no, that, that's a really good question, and I think um, to a lot of people, my two worlds just don't fit, so how, how do you take uh, what's going on in an African village and put it into clothing and into a $500 jacket, you know, it does seem like sort of a weird transition. Um, it really took me years to figure that out. Um, as I mentioned, I was moved by the things I was seeing, and I have this creative nature, so um, Really, <clears throat> it's a fine line. It's, it's just being authentic and being real and being considerate and being respectful. And also to me, it's about trying to tell that story. The need is there. And so it's just trying to tell the story in a different way. So being able to put a, a different spin on it and show um, the happy Africa and the inspiring Africa and the creative Africa. So I'm not doing collections where I'm showing uh, the, the real poverty, although the results of the collection are going to address the poverty. Instead, I've, I've been highlighting and extracting the elements that I think would interest people and move people and connect and inspire people here. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and it's amazing where you know that the proceeds are going to support a worthy cause, mm -hmm. but the number seems insignificant or moot when you see the smiles and the fact that people are surviving longer and their families are healthier because of the water you're bringing. That's amazing. We had a question back here. Thanks. I was really inspired by your talk, I'm May. And I'm just wondering if you could just explain your business model, because I'm in architecture and I'd like to do for profit work with nonprofit work. So I'm just wondering if you've set up a separate foundation where you can actually raise money or get grants or things like that, or if it's your for business model um, totally supports the foundation. Right. Well, if you're setting up a business model, you shouldn't follow mine <laughs> because it's quirky and weird and not traditional in any way. Um, I have Obaki and I have the Obaki Foundation. We've squished them together. Um, really what was happening with my company is that the end of the year, whatever money was made was rolling into our projects anyway. I just didn't publicly announce that. Um, but what I found is people were, were coming and buying our clothes and buying into the cause and I wanted them to know where their money was going and, and to know that they're a part of it just as much as we're a part of it. So right now, um, Obaki covers all of the administrative costs of the foundation. So if people donate money, 100% of that money goes to the projects, whether you're donating $20 or $200, $2,000, every penny of your public donation goes to um, the project, which I think is really important for people. I mean, you're wanting to give money, you should know where that money is going. Um, <clears throat> and then, <clears throat> excuse me, at the end of, uh, within, within our collections, we do little capsule collections where 100% of the proceeds of those pieces also go towards the project. So the red scarf campaign, for example, 100% of, of the proceeds of that go directly to water. And then again, in addition to it, at the end of the year, the net profits of Obaki the fashion side, um, all roll into our projects. So we really are 100% humanitarian. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Service around here. <laughs> I got my waiter's outfit on, at least. Hi, I'm Crystal. Um, so our question was, what does the future hold for the Obaki brand and its products? 
What I've been noticing since I've done this merge is that uh, we've, we've had a very um, high-end luxury customer that's been um, following us and buying our collections and a lot of retailers and wholesale uh, accounts that are supporting our product. But since we've come out with you know, the more meaningful uh, campaigns and, and initiatives, people have, a new group of people have started to come forward and they're saying, you know, I, I want to help, I want to be a part, I love what you're doing, I want to be a part of it, and we're really creating this community of people into, into our world to really be partners with it, um, with us in that. Um, but they can't necessarily afford a $500 jacket, so I was getting a lot of people saying, how can I help? I can't buy that $500 jacket, but I still want to help, what can I do? So Obaki's looking at launching um, some lower price point items, some more accessible um, pieces, maybe some merchandise, bags, scarves, wallets, uh, t-shirts, some things that open it up so that if you can't afford the, the jacket or a dress, then you can actually still be a part of it. We're also launching some creative campaigns, so um, recognizing that it's not just fashion, it's creative mediums, it's creative platforms in general. Uh, it can be photography, it can be art, it can be many things. So we're really just uh, getting our footing right now and then kind of spreading out. The more we can create uh, ourselves, we can use this creativity to create change, the more we will. So. Just some stunning imagery we saw in there as well, and a great example of how a mood board should look, too. Uh, I've got time for one more amazing question. I see a hand over here. No pressure. I don't know if it's amazing, but it's factual. Um, my name is Kelsey, and I'm just wondering how much it costs to drill one well. Yeah, well, it, all over the world it's a, a different um, rate, but we um, drill our wells from five to $10,000, depending on the well that we put in um, and depending on the region. So some of the outer regions where it's actually needed more is, is the $10,000 because of the terrain and the difficulty in getting the crews there. Um, so it's actually quite, quite affordable. I had a group of 64 kids in a West Van school uh, in six weeks fundraised enough money to drill a water well. And, um, so, uh, and with 100% of the money, of course, going towards the projects, it's easy for us um, to put that money quickly into the field. Um, yeah. So, Trina, thank you so much for your time today. Okay, thank you. And thank you for coming. <laughs> okay. Thanks.